Marshall Eddie Conway is a former member of the leftist Black Panther organization in the United States. In 1970, a Baltimore, Maryland police officer was shot and killed. Officers arrested Conway. A jury later convicted him. That's despite widespread doubts and inconsistencies with the evidence. He spent 43 years of his life in prison, and now he still maintains his innocence. Uh, Mr. Conway, thanks so much for, for joining us here today with Telosur. And thanks for having me. I, I want to talk about your story. Uh, start, let's start with how you, you got involved with the Black Panthers. Um, what what um, grabbed your attention with that organization? Well, initially I was in the Army. I was a sergeant in the Army in Europe. Uh, and I was on my way to Vietnam. And there was a series of riots and incidents in the black community in America. And one of them caught my attention. Uh, it was uh, uh, in Newark, New Jersey in 1967. Uh, there was a tank in the middle of the black community with a machine gun pointing at 30 or 40 black uh, women. And they were on the corner protesting. And so I read the story. and. It turns out that uh, some black guys had actually robbed uh, the National Guard Armory, took some weapons from the, uh, the armory. They declared a state of emergency in Newark, New Jersey. They went in the black community and locked up every single black man. Um, then they went through the community and ransacked all the houses. Um, after they got finished ransacking the houses, uh, they didn't do anything to put them back in order. So the women were out there protesting and they called out the tanks. And uh, it, it, I was incensed, you know, because I was in the army. I was getting ready to go to Vietnam. I was getting ready to fight for America. And then there's tanks in the black community pointing machine guns at black women, which could have been my mother. Uh, so I decided to get out of the army and come home and investigate what the problem was and after a period of about a year of investigating, I determined that we needed to have something to protect and defend our community, to organize our community, and the Black Panther Party at that time represented that. And, and so you got involved, and how long in, after you got involved were you accused of the murder of that um, police officer? About a year and a half, about 18 months. And take me through that. Well, during, it's, it's really strange because during that 18 months, and we were not aware of it at the time, the government had put in place a program called COINTELPRO. It was counterintelligence operation, and it was operated by the uh, uh, FBI, and it was uh, organized and designed to destroy the Black Panther Party. At that time, we were operating in 37 states. Uh, and so the COINTELPRO operation itself was unleashed upon us and in 18 months destroyed 25 of our chapters in, in 25 of those states uh, and locked up the, the national leadership, ran some of the national le leadership out of the country, assassinated some of our key members, uh, and locked up a lot of our secondary members. I was part of that secondary leadership, and so the consequences is that I got locked up. There were agent provocateurs working for the FBI, there were police informers, et cetera, and they had orchestrated a, a, a lot of different activities that were illegal, uh, and uh, they would create an incident, and 25 or 30 of us would go to jail because of the incident they created. Uh, two or three years later, we would discover that they were working for the police department or the government, but then we were locked up, we were in jail, and basically it, it took, and there's still Black Panther uh, former members in jail right now, it took 30, 40 uh, years for us to uh, win our freedom. So it sounds like you think they, were, they manipulated the system, they created incidents uh, in order to uh, get rid of your organization? Well, no, I don't think that. They had a hearing, the church committee hearings in 1975, this was after they had pretty much destroyed the Black Panther Party, uh, did an investigation in the Congress 
uh, in the Senate and they forced the FBI and other government agencies to release the files and the, uh, the church committee uh, uh, came up with 100,000 files in which they had launched 300 uh, illegal operations against black uh, liberation movement organizations and of those 300 uh, operations uh, 290 of them were directed against the Black Panther Party and uh, at the end of the hearings they determined that the FBI had acted illegally had formated trouble a uh, 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 chaos and violence among the Black Panther and uh, other organizations had uh, created situations that led to the assassination of our members had actively participated in the assassinations themselves. I mean, all this is documented, uh, documents were released, but by that time we were destroyed or in jail. And Mr. Conway, in your case, I was reading up, um, the court wouldn't let you use your own attorney. Later you, you, you learned that the jury was given improper instructions. When you look back now at the justice system, how it operated in your case, how it operated in, in cases around the country, uh, what do you think? Well, I think that uh, during the time of my trial, the, the criminal justice uh, system did not work. A uh, uh, hundred years before, uh, it did not work for black people, people of color, poor people. Uh, today, it's still not working. Uh, and you can see that in the fact that there's uh, two and a half million people in prison in America, uh, in the United States. Uh, but there's, uh, the United States has only 5% of the world's population, but it has like 25% of the world's prisoners. 75% uh, or 74% of those prisoners are people of color. Uh, so there's something uh, systemically wrong with the criminal justice system. And, uh, um, Economics is part of it, but racism and white supremacy is also part of it. 43 years of your life in prison. I was really impressed to read um, what the, the accomplishments you had while you were locked up. You, uh, I read you finished three college degrees. You started a new literacy program for other prisoners. Talk to me about that. Well, uh, early on, I think uh, when I came into the prison system, I decided that I uh, had uh, really suffered the consequences of a bad uh, justice system. I wanted to make some changes. Uh, I organized the prisoners uh, in the prison system to make changes for their self. But I think it was only toward the last maybe 10 years that I realized that I needed to organize to change the conditions in our community outside because a lot of the prisoners were going outside uh, with uh, negative attitudes, uh, with intentions of hurting other people or, or helping to destroy the black community. And so we organized a program uh, called Friend of a Friend from the American uh, Friends Service Committee. And we mentored young prisoners and we spread that uh, program throughout five prisons in America, I mean, in, in Maryland. And, uh, and we reached a number of people and actually we caused uh, the street organizations, and some people call them gangs, uh, to actually come together, sit down, and agree upon truces within the prison system. Those truces didn't extend outside, but in the prison systems now, in most cases, there's no violence among the different gangs. Uh, so that work was work that needed to be done because uh, the conditions in the, in the community 40 years after I got locked up was worse than it was before I got locked up. And let's talk a little bit about the system today and, and what we've seen recently in the news out of Ferguson, Missouri, the case of Michael Brown. Um, based, based on all of your experiences, what are your thoughts on that case? Well, my thoughts are that this, it's not unusual. It's nothing unusual in America about Ferguson. I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's common knowledge that uh, black men and women have been lynched throughout the 400 uh, years of history. Uh, uh, when the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense formed itself, it was about 
black men and black young people being shot and killed by the police. That was 50 years ago. That continues, uh, that had continued uh, uh, right up to Ferguson. Uh, in Oakland, uh, Oscar Grant was uh, shot point blank with no weapon. In New York, uh, several uh, uh, young black men were shot 30, 40 times at some, with no weapons. Uh, uh, even uh, while Ferguson was happening in Ohio, young people were shot and killed. Uh, in LA, young people were shot and killed. This is an epidemic that goes across the United States of America and it's part of the, the, the culture and the climate of keeping a certain population uh, oppressed uh, and protecting the property and the wealth of another segment of the population. And uh, it, it, it leads to one, violence in the community, among people in the community, and toward those forces that come in from outside to maintain control and it certainly leads violence from those forces to maintain that control in the community. And that means that across America, every week, somebody's being killed in sometimes in three, four or five different cities. So the explosion in Ferguson, I think, was just the straw that broke the camel's back in Ferguson. But it continues right across the country right now. And so what do we do to change this, this system? We've seen protests in Ferguson across the country. Uh, what do we do? Well, you have to organize. I mean, obviously, the one thing that's different about Ferguson that didn't exist in uh, uh, the Jenna Six or in Trayvon Martin's case in Florida, uh, people organize all across the country. They demonstrated, they walked, they rallied, they protest. Uh, but in Ferguson, it seems like the young people have decided to come forward. Uh, prior to that, older generation leaders were coming out, uh, civil rights leaders, uh, people that had been uh, brought into the system. They were uh, preaching uh, uh, calm, uh, using the criminal justice system, uh, uh, try to get civil rights cases, try to get money, et cetera. Young people, have, I think, have decided that none of those things are important and that they need to make the system itself understand that there's a value on the life of black people and people of color. Uh, and so they have acted out. But after that initial acting out, they have decided to start organizing. And they are not only organizing in Ferguson, they're organizing there in other cities and they are making connections. And I think they are developing an understanding that you can't continue to react to this stuff, but you need to put things in place so that you can actually take action. And one of the things I think that they are pushing for is community control of the police department with the ability to hire and fire police officers when they violate people's uh, human rights. And I, I think that's uh, what's been revealed in this case in Ferguson while uh, there's in that community there is a large portion of african-american residents that's not represented in the police force would you uh, that's a problem right well that's a problem but when you talk about white supremacy and when you talk about police force itself you're talking about people that have a vested interest in protecting the, the wealth and the, uh, uh, the interests of the, the ruling elite uh, and sometimes those people are also black. I don't think it's, I, I don't think a color matters as much as the mentality of them against us. In other words, if, if you were in a war in a combat zone and everybody was part of the enemy of say Iraq or in my case Vietnam, uh, then anybody that wasn't a police officer is considered fair game. Uh, and so whether you're white or black, there is a dis discrepancy in the numbers uh, uh, for sure, but there's also a mentality there that's involved. And that mentality is whether it's white or black, it's like we are in charge and they are the natives. And we need to control the natives and control that condition. The same officers, white and black, that, that abuse people in the black community 
won't go into the white and richer communities with that same behavior. They change that behavior when they change the territory. So it's something about a war zone that's involved in, in, in policing the black community or communities of color or poor white communities because they act the same way in poor white communities also. All right, well, thank you so much for coming in, sharing your story with us. Uh, truly fascinating. I could talk about it for okay. hours. Thank you for having me. All right. For From Caracas, I'm Cody Weddle. We'll see you again next week.